Hello, saplings and sassafrasses. My name is TV Sky, and um, what's the deal with Ivern? The Green Father is one of the most light-hearted and wholesome champions in the game, and he arrived with a peculiar set of gameplay mechanics that marked him out as the friend of the forest, unwilling to hurt a fly, but perfectly willing to root you to the ground so that his four bloodthirsty friends could stab you in the face over and over again. So, what's the story there? Why is he the way he is, and what story is he trying to tell us with his character design? Let's talk about that. And as usual, we're going to start by tackling his lore, the backstory that's supposed to be formed the basis for his character design and explain everything there is to know about him. And in very broad strokes, Ivern used to be a Freljordian chieftain, uh, just like a dude from the high north uh, who was rather upset when the Iceborn rose to power. The Iceborn, they are Lysandra's race of people, magic ice creature people, persons who are service in the service of void creatures, insofar as I remember their lore, and just generally were oppressive and bastards. Ivern the Cruel decides that it's not, it's not cool. They're bigger bastards than me. I don't like that. I'm going to set out to Ionia and steal the source of magic, which I have heard in legends exists there. So he goes to Ionia, murders a whole bunch of people, and manages to get himself to a grove called the Heart of the World, where he finds a giant magical tree called the God Willow. He cuts this tree down, trying to get a hold of its power, but in so doing, while he does manage to fell the God Willow and kill it, it seems to possess him, or something happens to him anyway, that turns him into a wood person, a, a dude who's literally just made out of tree and wood, and he's possessed by a weird spirit, some strange voice that tells him to watch. And as he watches, the remainders of his army who have been harassed to death by unseen attackers, uh, well, not unseen attackers, chimeric beings, half human, half animal, stalking the dwindling battalion, relentlessly cutting down the would-be conquerors. These, by the way, I believe are the first appearances canonically of the Vestaya. And I believe Ivern was released sometime before that lore update came out. I'm not exactly clear on the timeline. Uh, but essentially, his army has been cut down by the Vestaya, who are just kind of fed up with all his Freljord bullshit, and they kill all of his men, and he's forced to watch as their bodies lying on the battlefield rot and decay and become food for carrion birds and wolves, and they rot into fertile soil and become a sprout of life. Flowers, trees, plants, everything just kind of growing up all around it. From death comes life, and so Ivern is given... A Tutorial, a demonstration essentially of the circle of life in the classical sense. Next, he's told to listen, and he listens and he feels the sorrow of the entire world for the death of the god willow, which was a super important tree that he should definitely not have cut down, and he gets really, really sad about it because all of a sudden he has this sense demonstration of all the pain and the heartache and the damage that he has caused. The third time, the voice speaks and it says grow, and he doesn't really know what that means, so he decides, okay, I'll go out into the world and I'll learn about all the creatures and all the plants and all the animals that live out there, and maybe that'll give me some clue as to what the heck I'm supposed to do. So he spends like a couple of hundred years doing this, several centuries at the very least. He loses track, he doesn't really know. And he becomes friends to all animals everywhere, all plants everywhere, all of the trees. He becomes the Green Father, dubbed this way by the humans that he encounters who take him for a mythical creature because, well, that's essentially what he is now. And then for the fourth time, the voice speaks and tells him to show. And this is in reference to Ivern does not have a great relationship with humans anymore because they tend to kill animals and cut down trees and not give a whole lot back to nature. And he's kind of upset that they're all just full of like violence and murder and death and bad hunting practices. And he's been, so the voice tells him to show, and he takes that as a challenge or as a mission to go out into the world and show the humans that there is another way to live, that you can live without violence and destruction in your lives, that, 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 that there is a better way. Secondly, there is a short story called The Gift of Venom, or just Gift of Venom, um, which is a story where not a lot happens, really. It's a story about a bunch of hunters who are killing creatures, taking their horns in very cruel ways. Like, the, the creatures are really suffering in order for the hunters to take their horns. Ivern is not super jazzed about it, but he also doesn't really know how to be angry. Um, so the hunters are taught a lesson, as it were. Not Ivern doesn't kill them or anything. Like, he's not... He's not quite that bad, um, but 
he encounters a young hunter and essentially teaches her a little bit of a lesson about what it means to pay respect to nature. And the hunter in turn, like Ivern learns something about how to deal with hunters being cruel to animals like that. He comes to a decision that it has some place in the grand circle of life. That's essentially what's going on in this story. The primary thing we can take away from this story, though, is the insight that it gives us into Ivern's thought process, how he thinks, how he relates to humanity. Because he's kind of, he has pretty much forgotten what it's like to be human. Like when he encounters the young hunter and they see him for the first time and they're understandably kind of terrified by the walking tree who has come after them after they have committed bad hunting practices. Um, and he doesn't really know why that, oh, she's scared. That's weird. I don't know why that is. Um, so that's sort of what the story is trying to give us an insight into is just how much he has forgotten his humanity, as it were, how, and how his mind works. Like, he constantly thinks in terms of the relationships between various creatures and nature. Like, that happens all the time. Like, this story has so many... He settled a long-standing dispute between a colony of lichen and their host boulder, helped each generation of winter squirrels find their forgotten autumn acorns, and coaxed a lone wolf to rejoin her pack despite the fact that they once called her howling shrill. Ivern knew sassafras to be anxious trees, raising their leaves in panic over the slightest stray salt snail. After all, hunting wasn't so bad, for nothing is wasted or senseless in the cycle of life. But the sassafras had word, the robins, who told the butterflies, and the butterflies knew a secret, so did the entire forest. He, he thinks constantly in terms of relationships between different things in nature. Like, that's how his mind operates. So, what's the deal with him? Well, I have a lot of thoughts about Ivern's lore. And the first thoughts I have are very positive. I really like this character. I really, really, really like him as a presence in League of Legends because he is so unashamedly, nakedly, unabashedly positive and happy and pleasant and friendly and kind and just a super incredibly nice guy for no reason except he wants to be a nice guy. And that's really refreshing in League of Legends because League of Legends loves itself some tragic backstories. It loves itself some, you know, coolness with a hint of darkness underneath it. It loves itself some badasses and some super strong fighters and some cool dudes. It doesn't have a whole lot of characters like Ivern who are just kind of completely and utterly wholesome and happy and nice and there's really nothing else going on there. And the one little blot on that uh, that version of him is that Ivern has a tragic backstory. And that's, when it comes to my problems with his lore, that's really the, that's, that's one of the cruxes of my problems with his lore is that Ivern, the happiest, nicest, most pleasant, not dark, just friendly, lovable, forest father type dude in the entire game has a tragic dark backstory and that to me is a kind of tonal whiplash that doesn't really work and it doesn't work for a number of reasons the whole thing in this in this lore and you should really read it yourself because i'm not i'm not reading through it with you is i can see the function the function of having ivern having have once been human is to give us the audience an insight into what it means to be ivern that's why we have these se these sequences where we get this tutorial on the circle of life we get this tutorial on what it means to take something from nature and what it means to to feel responsible for all the creatures and the animals and what it means to to have a community with nature and to, to know the connection between all life. All of that is kind of esoteric stuff that's sort of a little foreign to the human mind. So one of the ways to bring us into that is to have a human character who's experiencing it and then tell us what the human character is experiencing as a kind of narrative anchor to help us understand what's happening. The trouble is that could have been any human character. Anywho, like it could have been like a hunter who hunted too much and nature had to teach him a lesson or something. It could have been a lumberjack, like a lumberjack who was like, wow, that's a great tree. I'm going to cut that tree down. Oops, turns out it was the god willow. And exactly the same thing happens. It punishes him by turning him into Ivern. And the story is off from exactly the same, from exactly the same origin. What it did not need to be was that Ivern was a conqueror from the Freljord who was fighting the Iceborne and he led a legion to Ionia and invaded them and then he brought his legion into it and then there was Thyatek. All of that is fluff to me. All of that is, is pointless. 
It doesn't do anything. It doesn't inform his character. It doesn't change anything substantial about who he is. And it doesn't come back. It like it doesn't plant anything that seems to lead to any kind of a payoff with him. And the po the problem is that you could rip out all of it. Like you could really take away all this stuff. You don't really need the explanation of the circle of life and how he sees that everything that, that dies becomes food for the next generation, all that stuff. If you removed like 90% of this lore, just like 90% of it, and just presented the character as he is, he wouldn't be confusing. Like there's, there's, there's you don't really need to explain Ivern that much. That's the thing. Like, I know I said that the point of having a human character is to make some rather esoteric concepts relatable on a human scale. Yeah. But on the other hand, you can also do that without needing the that like that complete POV thing. And that's something that's been done before, and it's been done really well by Lord of the Rings, in which the presentation of Treebeard is just kind of, well, he's ancient and he has always existed and he's really fond of nature. And we don't really know anything more about, but like, there's really no explanation of Treebeard in Lord of the Rings, but he still works perfectly fine as a character because you understand why he has this relationship with nature through the way that he behaves, through the way that he talks to other characters. So you don't really need all this stuff because Ivern as a character is kind of self-explanatory. At least I think so. And the other part of it, like I said, that bothers me is that he had to have a dark backstory. Like, it really had to be, oh, he was the cruelest man in the world and he was conquering and being a bad guy and tearing things down. But then one day he went too far and there were consequences and he had to learn a lesson about his behavior and turn into a completely different character who doesn't display any of the characteristics associated with his previous life, who doesn't have any callbacks, who isn't really driven by... It. That's the th other thing about Ivern is he's he's not really visibly driven by what he did as Ivern the Cruel. Like, there's a line here at the end. Um, the resolve he'd once felt returned, but this time it wasn't driven by malice or cruelty. One day he hoped to replace what he took. If he was to be called the new God Willow, he needed to cultivate humanity, help them help them watch, listen, and grow. Being human once himself, Ivor knew this would be difficult, so he smiled and challenged himself to complete this task before the final setting of the sun. He knew he would have the time. This is the justification for having him be, um, the cruel conqueror once upon a time, is that as a former human himself, he has a kind of insight into humanity that he can use to bring the gospel of nature, as it were, to humanity to help them become a better species. But then that is immediately undercut when we come into this lore story and Ivern, everything we see about him is... He doesn't... Really, no, it's like, Ivern watched as the young hunter stepped out of the grassy maze and approached the Shagak's body, the sh Shagyak, that's the creature they've been hunting. The poor thing looked positively terrified. She clearly had never seen anything or anyone quite like himself before. He tried to be gentle, but humans tended to be so individual in their reactions. Unlike, say, the caterwauling of smug mularks, which is a bad line anyway. Um, Please, don't be frightened, unless that is your natural state, in which case, fright away. I'll wait. I really don't mind. It wasn't Ivern's intention to frighten anyone, but no one can account for another being's experience. Get on with it, Rispel said. Her voice quavered, her eyes flinched. I've trespassed, I know. I'm at your mercy. Just let it be quick. Be quick, Ivern shrugged. Certainly, it didn't cross my mind that you might have better places to be. Very well, then. But I only want to know why, Ivern said in a voice filled with merriment. He gestured with his branch-like finger to the shack yak's body. His arms stretched longer than it should to the dead beast's back where he lovingly stroked his... Like, the whole point of this scene and the whole point of having this confrontation between Ivern and the young hunter is to show that Ivern has no freaking idea what it's like to be a human. Like, he, he has no understanding of how humans view him or how they view nature or why a hunter might take the horns from a dead creature without taking the rest of the meat and the bones and, and using it all up in a respectful way. But he, he, 
He was this person. He was that cruel hunter who took and took and took and gave nothing back. That was the whole point of all of the lore before was that this was who he was. He was the guy who would kill a creature just to take its horns and leave the corpse and not give a shit. He was the guy who would cut down a tree without caring about the consequences. He was that guy. And kind of the whole point of him having been human himself was that that was supposed to give him some sort of human quality with which he would be more able to carry out his mission of becoming the new god Willow and changing humanity for the better. That, that's the whole point of making him human at all. But then in the lore story, and indeed in his lore, in, in, in his interactions in, in the game, in his voice lines, there's none of that. Like, there's no, there's no reflection of who Ivern once was. There's no reflection of the cruel war leader who needed to learn a lesson and, and become a better person. There's no, he doesn't really have any voice lines that suggest that he's filled with regret for something he once did. He isn't really driven by sorrow or a need to compensate for the crime that he committed. None of that is in the character when he's presented in what little lore content and the voice lines that we have. And so there's a massive dissonance where all of this nonsense, and I'm sorry to call it that, but all of this nonsense about the war leader and the Iceborne and Freljord and blah, 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 does nothing. It doesn't do anything. It doesn't plant anything. It doesn't pay off anywhere. It doesn't, it, it has no effect on him. And you could rip it all out and make him exactly the same character and it wouldn't be incongruous. And that's really the problem. And by the way, one of my major problems with the way this apprentice ascended, he has this whole lore backstory about being a fierce warrior with an iron will and an unflinching resolve. And then the Iceborne rose to prominence and looked down on him and blah, blah. Ivor and the cruel bad and hard battalion. He wants to grab the source of all magic and take it back to free the Freljord by using this power. Like, that's the whole mission. That's the whole inciting incident that sets him on a path to becoming the Green Father is that thing. Like, that's the whole rationale, the whole reason why any of this happens at all. And there's no part of that that's ever paid off anyway. He doesn't have any voice lines that make reference to the Freljord. He doesn't have any interactions with the voice lines. Lysandra is an Iceborne. She's the queen of the Iceborne. She's in the game. Ivern doesn't have a voice line for her. He doesn't have an interaction. He doesn't have a, ooh, I remember you, or oh, I, from a past life, anything like that. Nothing. He has no voice lines for Sichuani or Lissandra. I don't think he has any voice lines for any Freljord champion whatsoever. He has no voice lines that reference the Freljord, no voice lines that reference any part of that. And that's frustrating because they spent so much time setting up this whole tragic backstory where he has this deep connection to the Freljord and blah, blah, blah. And then nothing happens with it. And I'm not a Chekhov's gun purist. Like, I don't think everything you set up necessarily has to be paid off. But this does, though. This thing, this, the inciting incident, the core of who he was supposed to be, the, the thing that sets him off on the path to being Ivern at all, is never paid off. It's never talked about. Nothing of ever comes of it. Maybe something in the future with lore content, whatever. But the character as he's presented, as we see him in the game right now, Bumpkiss. Zero, zilch, zimp, nothing. And that's just bad writing. Like, I, I'm sorry. It just, it's bad writing. It's, it's not a compelling character. It doesn't, it doesn't add or lend anything to his thematics. It's just, it's just a pointless detail that detracts from what is otherwise a really good character. Like, you should really read the Gift of Venom story. Because it's really quite good. And his characterization and the, and the way that he's presented is just kind of delightful. Because it is so unabashedly corny. It is so Beatrice Potter. It is so children's storybook. And it's it's a delight. It's refreshing. It's wonderful. And then there's all this edgelord nonsense about warlords and the Freljord that doesn't mesh with it. It doesn't do anything. It doesn't inform it. It doesn't change it. It doesn't anything. There's uh, frustrating. Anyway, let's talk about his character design. That's theoretically also what we're here to do. And it's been 20 minutes now, almost. So it's probably a good time to get to it. To talk about Ivern's character design, we have to talk about his character design in the context of another character design. Maokai. Because here's the thing. Maokai and Ivern, from a visual standpoint, have exactly the same basic concept. That is, a tree that has come to life, and that is walking around, and that is, you know, acting in a combat situation, as it were. Ivern kind of doesn't really fight directly, 
very much. Uh, but, but nonetheless, that's sort of the core concept. They're both tree ants. They're both ants, depending on how exactly you want to, what 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 version of that mythological well, logical creature you want to use. And so it's inevitable that they're going to share some design characteristics. And here we have a great case study in how to create two completely unique, completely separate designs that don't infringe on each other, that don't kind of step on each other's design toes, as it were, without having to say, oh, they have to be different species, or they have to be a completely different thing. No, no, they have a lot of similarities, but they're so different that nobody would ever mistake one for the other. With Ivern, essentially, well, let's start with Maokai, actually, because Maokai came first. Maokai is the big, angry tree stump, essentially. Like, he, he's lumbering, he's sort of big, he's heavy, he has these... He, it sounds like he makes thundering noises when he walks. Like, it sounds like every step he takes is like... That kind of thing. And he has this giant arm and this sort of hunched back, misshapen kind of... He doesn't really look agile. He doesn't really look like he could jump and skip over a fallen log or something. He looks like he would just kind of burst through. And that's very much the core of, of Maokai, because he's also a tank. Like, that's his gameplay design demands that he be this big, sturdy, kind of slightly slow thing. And that's perfectly communicated in his character design. Um, Maokai is one of the strongest of the older League of Legends character designs, by the way. Like, he, he's, he's really, he's unexceptional, but in terms of executing on his concept, it's really quite good. Now take a look at Ivern, by contrast. He is just... Sticks. <laughs> he's he's a little bit of of he's like a beard with legs. It's essentially what's going on there. He's like this big bearded happy face with a couple of arms and some legs. He's like a child's drawing of a person that's been rendered by a much more talented artist and brought to life. And it, it works really, really well. But there's an interesting something I noticed that's a fun similarity between the two. See Ivern's eyebrows that are made of leaves? see what he shares with Maokai, see? And this is a great example of using exactly the same design element, that is, turning eyebrows into leaves, like using leaves to give the appearance of eyebrows, but doing it in two completely different ways, because where Maokai's leaf eyebrows are kind of, they almost look like lichen or moss, and they're just kind of spiky and, and, and kind of bushy and stuff, Ivern's eyebrows almost look more like eyelashes, right? Like he's wearing like the greenest, best mascara in the entire world, or like big fake lashes that just kind of stand out from his face. So they serve this kind of dual purpose, but they have this completely different, much gentler, much softer, much rounder expression than exactly the same design element when realized on Maokai. And that's just good design practice. Is that like, you have the exact same design element, but you express it in such different ways that they don't look like each other at all, and that's that's just that's just good craftsmanship. Another thing that's important to note as a difference between Ivern and Maokai is the eyes. Now, I'm gonna link in the description to a video by Lindsay Ellis um, called "Coding the Alien," I think, uh, where she talks a lot about how you design something to be alienating and other, and and to be scary and impersonal, and how you design a character design to be personal, relatable, something that humans want to empathize and connect with. And one of the big things she brings up, and she's right, is the eyes, because Ivern has what can best be described as big, bright puppy dog eyes. Like, compared to the rest of his face, his eyes are really, honestly, oh, I should not do it that way, there. His eyes are quite big, big, really, like, they're, they're very prominent as facial features on the character, whereas with Maokai, those are kind of small, like especially the, the eye on the left is sort of barely a slit and they have no pupils and they have no sort of recognizable humanity to them because they're just kind of glowy holes in his head that makes him look more alien, more distant, more unfriendly, more hostile. Um, and that again is, it would have been easy to give Ivern glowing eyes because he already has this magic glowing motif with uh, the, the yellow flower and stuff. That would have been very easy to do, but a big part of the reason why they don't is because we want him to be friendly. There's a reason they call it puppy dog eyes. It's because one of the things that makes puppies and kittens and babies so lovely to human eyes, despite the fact that babies are objectively very ugly, is that we are hard-coded in our brains. We have a just... We are hard-coded to sympathize with things that look like babies, with things that have big eyes relative 
to the size of their head. And that's one of the tricks you can use in character design when you want a character to instantly appear likable and friendly give them big eyes. This is also something, um, if you watched my video on the trailer for the new Bumblebee movie, I touched on briefly, I think that Bumblebee's face is much more relatable and approachable. And a big part of the reason why is that Bumblebee in the new spin-off movie has had, has much bigger and much brighter eyes than he does in the Michael Bay Transformers movies. And that's a simple design trick that makes a character so much more relatable. It's the same thing for the Iron Giant. Like, take a look at that character design one, uh, once and take a look at the relationship of the size of the eyes to the rest of the face. And that's part of why he becomes so friendly looking. Um, and that's something that works really well for Ivern. And that's also, he also has a much more human face in general. Like he's got lips, tree lips, which is kind of weird, but it works. He's got this big kind of broken fat nose on the on the front of his head, which again, Maokai doesn't really have a nose. He doesn't have lips. He just has this kind of jagged, Glasgow Joker smile splitting his face in two, which again makes him appear more unfriendly and alien. Um, and that all works really well. And again, because the rest of the character design, I like, guess just he's just got these stick arms and these stick legs and barely any body, the head and the face becomes a like proportionally, they are a big part of his character design. Like I think it's like most of his character model is really concentrated around that beard and around that head by volume. And that emphasizes his face. It emphasizes his relatability. It emphasizes his friendliness. Like it, it, even when you're looking at him as a character model, fairly small on screen over here on the left and, and the one uh, second from the left, you can still see his eyes. You can clearly identify where his eyes are in the character model. And again, the human brain is hard coded to look for these things and will always prefer a face with eyes to a face with none, and a lot of other character models in League, once you see them, like from above, from a game perspective, their eyes are like, if they're visible at all, you'd be lucky. This is part of the reason why, by the way, the Yordles all, uh, especially like Tristana and Poppy, have really big eyes on their character models, so that they can they show up when you can occasionally can see them facing towards you. You can see their eyes, and that again makes them cuter and and kind of more lovely. And it's why chibi style is even a thing. Uh, what else about Ivern? Yes, he's got some remnants of his human past. Like, this is something I commend the character artists for. They were told that, okay, he used to be this Freljordian conqueror guy. Okay, so we want to represent that somehow in the character design. And indeed, they do. First of all, he's got an earring hanging from uh, the right side of his head, or the left side on the screen over here. And secondly, he's got this gauntlet that's kind of old and broken and, and, and kind of disjointed, and it's got this big mushroom growing out of it, but it's still a gauntlet of the sort that you might expect a human person to wear, but which otherwise doesn't really make any sense for Iver Ivern to be wearing, because he's... Why would he? Why would he be wearing a human thing, except as an echo of the fact that he used to be human himself? And this... Like I said, I don't really like all this human business and, and the way that story is expressed, but from the character design perspective, that's a very effective way to kind of call back to that, that there's like some stuff that's just kind of on him, but it's not like he has fashion really going on. It's not like he wears human clothes or has clearly made new human stuff to put on himself. It's just, oh, there's some bits that are still attached, especially the metal bits that don't rot away with time, and they're just still kind of hanging there but he doesn't really pay attention to them. They're not really an intentional part of who he is. They're just something that's stuck to him, like the mushrooms that grow all over the rest of him. Uh, speaking of the mushrooms, by the way, they are one of the, uh, a very lovely little feature of Ivern because they create asymmetry in his character design. He's got this mushroom on um, the arm with the gauntlet that you can see over here, but then he's got the other mushroom that kind of grows on his head and that kind of breaks up the profile um, of his head. He's got a lot of asymmetry going on with his head, really. Like, he's got the earring on one side, then he's got this twisted branch-like structure on the right side of his head. Um, and that's asymmetry. And then he's got the mushroom on one side, side, but not on the other, and that's more asymmetry. And that asymmetry, I think, serves a purpose, because it tells us that the character is a little bit, air quotes, unbalanced. Like, he's, he's not 
super serious. He's not super well put together. He's just kind of whimsical and silly and not really symmetrical. Like, symmetry is something we kind of tend to associate with, like, order and rigid structures and stuff like that. But asymmetry tells us, oh, this character isn't too concerned with rules. He's not really... He's not so straight-laced. He doesn't really have a stick up his ass, which is ironic given that he's a tree and his, and his entire ass is made of stick. But anyway... <laughs> um... And that works quite well, because it kind of communicates this sense of, of randomness, of whimsy, that infects so much of the rest of the character. Just look at his posture in these screenshots, by the way. Look how lovely that is. Like, he's a curious person. That's what the posture in these screenshots is communicating. He's leaning forward. He's literally leaning in to see what's further ahead, because he's curious. He's excited to go and do stuff. And that's being communicated with his body language just as much as Maokai's kind of dour, angry sort of curmudgeonly nature is communicated by his slouching, kind of hunched over stance and, and very sort of planted nature is, is it's being communicated in the same way. And this is just the lesson in terms of if you're thinking of applying any of what I've said to your own character design, and good lord, this video is over half an hour long, then think of the expression of the Ents in Lord of the Rings. Because just as Maokai and Ivern are two very different expressions of the same basic tree man concept. The same thing goes for the Ents in Lord of the Rings. They're some of my favorite character design from that entire movie franchise and indeed from, from just from movies in general because it's such a stroke of brilliance to say, okay, there are lots of different kinds of trees and these trees, when they get really, really old, can look weird in very unique and interesting ways. And so the character designers in Lord of the Rings used this as the basis for designing these very strange, very varied looking different ends for the movie and they're they're just some of my favorite parts because they're a demonstration a visual demonstration that even if you're ex if you're essentially doing the same character concept over and over and over again for an entire cast of characters there's still so much room for making individuals for making special character designs even within really tight constraints which is a man a, a tree that's kind of shaped like a person you can do all kinds of things, and this applies too when it comes to character designs for humans. Like, I know with trees you can kind of be more free to mess around with their anatomy and stuff, but this applies to humans as well. Even if you're given the task of, say, designing 50 identical stormtroopers, there's all kinds of little stuff you can do. You can give one of them a little badge, or one of them has a scratch on his armor, or like some of them have, have different accessories, some of them have the, like scratches of paint or dirt on them. Like, there's all kinds of stuff you can do, even within like the tightest possible restrictions, you can always create interesting variations on the same character design. Anyway, that's sort of the lesson I want to be the takeaway from this video, and also that you shouldn't give a character a whole involved weird dark backstory if it's not going to actually reflect anywhere in any part of who the character actually is. Anyway, this video is too long already. I'm going to stop now. If you have enjoyed it, <laughs> somehow, <laughs> if you've made it through to the end, Thank you very much for watching. Thank you very much for sticking with me. Um, thank you very much for even clicking on this video in the first place. I, I, I know there, there must be shorter, more exciting videos out there. And we thank you very much for choosing TV Sky Entertainment for all of your YouTubing needs. If you want to, you can subscribe to the channel. You can leave a like if you're so inclined or a comment. I try to read all of my comments and I try to be aware of what's going on down there and respond to some of them sometimes. So you can do that. And if you want to, uh, I have a Patreon that you can support with whatever, like a dollar a month, that's that's more than plenty, that's that's uh, more than I could ever hope for, uh, from most of you. Um, and I'd be very grateful for the help, because Patreon helps me have food and stuff, which, I mean, I like food, it's, it's, it's a healthy part of a, of a diet to have food, um, and rent and stuff. So thank you very much to those of you who do do that. You're scrolling on screen right now, I love all of you. Now, there's also a dislike button down below, uh, but I've lost my little almanac, so I mean, I've been looking at it, but I can't figure out whether it's like the common delicious dislike button, which you can like, you can put it in a stew or in a sandwich, and it kind of tastes good and it absorbs a lot of flavor and it's kind of, it's a really good for a soup, or whether it's the poisonous mal dislike button, which is like, it's like, it's not, if you just touch it, you're gonna get a rash, but it's not terrible, but if you eat it, like, it's gonna make your throat swell up, and then you're gonna die within, like, a few hours, unless we can get you to the hospital, and I don't know which one it is, so, like, if you wanna click on it, at least you should use gloves, and probably, like, it's probably just best if you don't at all, but I'll leave that up to you.
Thank you very much for watching.